We're going to talk about regular expressions. This is probably something that you've encountered before in your time in the program, but this is kind of the spot where we want to drill into them in a little bit more detail. Regular expressions are ubiquitous in software engineering and computer science in general. You'll find them in various tools in operating systems like pattern matching tools like the Unix grep program. You'll find them in text editors and IDEs for searching for particular strings in a text file or for being able to do search and replace operations. You'll use them in uh, this course in particular for validation of inputs. So because a regular expression allows you to specify a pattern that you want to match in some detail, you can do things like, for example, match a phone number or a zip code or something that's more significant and more complex than just, say, matching a string of a particular length or the presence or absence of a field or something like that. Regular expressions will give you the power that you need to be able to do all of those kinds of things and, and much more. So we're going to look at how do we define regular expressions and then how do we use regular expressions. So first of all, defining a regular expression. Well, a regular expression is really just a string that expresses or contains a pattern that's then used to match another string. So we're defining a pattern and then we can take another string and say, does that string match the pattern that we've specified? In JavaScript, there's a couple of ways to define regular expressions. One is to use this literal syntax. So if we bracket a regular expression with forward slashes, then the th characters that are, appear inside the slashes make up the regular expression. So this is a literal, just like a string literal or a constant. Uh, you can just write it directly in the syntax of the language. There's also a regular expression class or object in JavaScript. So if we write the, or if we create a new object with a constructor for the reg exp object, that also creates a regular expression. Uh, and in this case, we actually supply it with a string containing the characters that make up the regular expression. So those are two ways of defining a regular expression. Again, it's just a string of characters that express a particular pattern. So the game is to kind of figure out, well, all of the different kinds of things that we can put in that string that defines a pattern, how do they work? What do they mean? How do we interpret them? And how are they used to do pattern matching? So the simplest and most common kinds of thing to put in a regular expression is just a literal character. So this constitutes most of the characters in the character set, and all a literal character does is matches itself. So for example, if we have a regular expression like this of just a consisting of a B, well, it will match a B. So if we define a regular expression with that pattern and we ask it, do you match that particular string? The answer is yes. Similarly, if we ask it, does it match the string ABC? Well, it turns out that the answer to that is also yes, because there is a B in there. So all we're saying here is the pattern has to contain a B, and this string does contain a B, so that is a match. So both of these strings match B. Now the rest of the learning curve on understanding regular expressions in detail is learning about other characters that have specific meanings within a regular expression. So unlike the majority of the characters, all of the letters, all of the digits, and so forth, they just match themselves. These other characters, which we'll call special characters, or sometimes they're referred to as meta characters because they have a meaning, meaning kind of all their own, there's, those are the ones that we have to learn specifically so that we understand how the patterns work. So they have a special meaning in the pattern. So for example, here's a meta character, the plus sign. So we've got a s pattern similar to what we had up here, but we've now got a B with a plus. And the plus sign, we'll look into this in more detail later, uh, says well, I want you to match one or more of the thing that just came prior to the plus sign. So this is going to match one or more B characters. And since B matches itself, we're done in interpreting the regular expression. So this would match the entirety of this string, just a B, but it would also match a pair of Bs or a whole sequence of Bs. That pattern would match all of those things that I've shown here with the underline. Okay, let's look in more detail at some of these meta characters. So the dot, just a single period matches any character in the input string. So if we have a pattern that just contains that dot, it's going to match any single character. So it would match the A, 
and it would match a string containing AA. So it's got the first A is the one that's going to match the dot. The other one can come along for the ride, that's fine. And then a string that just contains an actual dot will also match the dot. Not because it's the same character, but because it is matching an arbitrary character. So the dot itself in the input string counts as a character that's going to match, be matched by the dot. Think for a second about just an empty string. Is that going to match a dot? Well, the answer is no, actually, because the dot has to match some character, any character, but it has to have a character to match. Here's another regular expression example with a dot. So here's an A followed by a dot, which means an A and any character. So it's going to not match just an A because there has to be an A followed by some other character. But it will match AA because it's an A followed by a character, AX because it's an A followed by a character, and it will also match A or WX, AYZ because there's an A followed by any character. So those will all match except for the, the single A. Finally, A dot BC. It's not going to match ABC because there's no character here between the A and the B. It will match ABBC because the dot will match the B, so that's going to match. And let's see this last one. We've got AXBC. It will match that portion of the string, so that will also match. There's several ways to express quantity in a regular expression, and we're going to look at those next. The uh, simplest one is the question mark, which means match zero or one of the previous element of the pattern. And that's important to keep in mind. It's always looking at, back at the previous pattern element. So an A question mark means to match zero or one A's. So because it can match zero A's, it will match the empty string. It will also match a single A or two A's. That would match the first one. It would also match BA because there would be an A here that would be at least one A. And it would match B and two A's. It would match that first A. More complex version of this would be A, B, question mark, C. Here, again, because the question mark only applies to the previous pattern element, it's going to apply to the B. So this is going to match an A, zero or one B's, and a C. So A and B not going to match, right? It does match the A and it does match a B, but there's no C there to match. A and C would match because we have an A and zero B's. A, B, C of course matches because we've got an A and the one B. But then again in the last example here we've got an A, a B, and then another B. But what we need is either zero or one B's followed by a C. So this one will not match. The star matches zero or more than zero. So here's an example, A star matches zero or more of the previous thing, zero or more A's. So this will definitely match one A. It will match more than one A. It will match a string that has an A and anything else. It will match several A's and anything else. Will it match this one? That's an interesting question. You might think that because there's no A's at all in that string, that A star would not match that string. But in fact it will, because that string has zero A's. And zero or more is what we're matching here. In fact, this is a little bit of a trick in the sense that A star will basically match any string, because it just has to have zero or more A's in it. So it will match here, which is a little weird looking, and it will also match the empty string, which has zero A's. The cross, the plus, matches one or more. So here we've got A, B plus, C. So it's going to be an A, one or more B's, and a C. A, one or more B's, and a C matches the first one. A, one or more B's, and a C matches there. A, one B, and a C matches this portion of that string. A, a bunch of B's, and a C matches here. And finally, we've got one where we've got an A and a C, but we have no B's between those. And because we've got to have at least one B to have one or more, it will not match this string. 
We can also be a little bit more nuanced about the number of matches that we are looking for for a particular element of the pattern. So if we use a single number enclosed in curly braces, that says match exactly that number of the previous thing. So here's a regular expression that shows an example of that. This says match exactly three of the previous thing, or three A's. So AA will not match because there's only two of them. AAA matches fine. AAA of a string also matches fine because there is exactly three A's there. Now you might think, well, there's actually four A's there, but the fact that there is a spot in the pattern that matches three of them is sufficient to satisfy the regular expression. We can also, the second syntax up here is that we can say match M or more times by just putting a comma in the curly braces. So this says match two or more A's. So this only has one A, no match. Here we've got two A's. Here we've got more than two A's. It's all matching just fine. And then if we want to also put a bound on the upper limit of the number of matches, we can include two numbers inside the curly braces. So this says match an X between two and four A's and a Y. So X, A, Y, no match because we only have one A. Here we've got two A's, so that will match. Here we've got X, A, 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 that's between two and four A's and a Y. Here we've got X, A, 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 and then X, A, 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 Y. So this will match, but it's important to keep in mind that the place where it will match is right here. As the pattern matching engine is moving through the string that it's testing, it's going to see an X, and then it's going to see three A's, which satisfy the two to four boundary over here, but then it's not going to see a Y. It's going to see another X. At that point, the regular expression engine is going to kind of try over again to see if it can now match from this point going forward, when it failed to match in this portion of the string. So ultimately it will succeed. And what we'll see here is that the regular expression engines tend to be quite aggressive at trying to find a match somewhere in the input string. So far we've been able to match patterns at any point in the input. And there's a couple of ways to sort of anchor the match. And the caret, the up arrow, says to constrain the match to happen only at the beginning of, this, of the input string. So when we put the, the caret as the first character in the regular expression, it's saying match an A, a B, and a C, but only at the very beginning of the input. So here's an A, B, C at the beginning of the input, and that will match. However, the second example, because the first character is an X and not the A, this will not match. Similarly, if we use the up caret with a wild card, we're saying, match at the beginning of the string any character followed by an A and a B. So this one not going to match because we need to have some arbitrary character that's not the A or the B appearing here at the beginning of the string. If we have X, A, B, that's a match because we've got a, an arbitrary character in A and a B. And if we have more than one character before the A and the B at the beginning of the string, this will not match because we've constrained the thing to match at the beginning of the string with an arbitrary character followed by AB. And because we've got two characters before the AB start here, it will not match. The opposite case is to match only at the end of the string. When we put a dollar sign in as the last character of the pattern, we're saying only match at the end of the string. We've got PQR dollar sign. This is going to only match strings that end with P, Q, and R. So this guy is going to match because it's PQR at the end. This will also match because it's PQR at the end. But now we've got PQRR before we get to the end of the string. So this is not going to match. I should have pointed out back here that the caret only has this special meaning if it is the very first character in the regular expression. If we were to have a regular expression say that said a, b, caret, c, the caret now has lost its special meaning. We're, we're asking here now to actually match a literal a, b, caret, and a c. The meaning of the caret when used as an anchor means anchor at the beginning of the pattern. It only makes sense if it appears here at the beginning of the pattern. Anywhere else, 
we'd basically be saying, well, if we put it in this position, we're saying, well, match an A and a B, and then at the beginning of the line, match a C. That doesn't make any sense. So the, the meaning of this thing loses its special significance if it's anywhere other than at the beginning of the pattern. Similarly, the dollar sign only has this special meaning if it appears at the end of the pattern. So just like before, if we were to say P, Q, dollar sign R, we're saying, well, I want to match a P and a Q and the end of the string and then an R. Again, that doesn't make any sense. So it loses its special meaning. This would literally look for a P, a Q, a dollar sign, and an R somewhere in the string. So we've got the dollar sign here appearing at the end. We can use these two things together as well. So I can have an anchor at the beginning of the string and an anchor at the end, and this will only match strings that consist of an A and a B and nothing else, because we've anchored the beginning and the end. So A, B, of course, will match, but these other guys will not, because now there's something before the A, B, and then this one won't match because there's something after the A, B. Okay, what do these regular expressions match? Well, you can kind of just read them out literally. Uh, this is going to say uh, anchored at the beginning and at the end of the string at any character in A and any other character. The second example shows anchoring at the beginning and the end of the string and in between match any three characters. So any character that any string that has exactly three characters will match. This last one is actually looks kind of weird but is quite helpful in a lot of cases when you're processing input text with a regular expression matcher. We're basically saying the string has to start with that anchor and end with that anchor. And you notice that there's nothing in between the two anchors. So this guy actually matches empty strings. Which turns out to be really helpful if you're reading in a text file and you've got, say, some lines of the text file have data on them and others are empty. You want to throw away the empty ones. So this is a great pattern to use in those kinds of cases. It's often the case that we'd want, like to match one of several characters at a particular spot in the input string. And the job, or that's the job for what's called a character class. And this is the syntax for character class. It's a pair of square brackets with some stuff inside. And what's going to appear in there is going to be characters that we'd like to match but we only want to match one of them at any particular point in the in the input pattern. So if we have a regular expression like this one, we've got a character class going on, and it's got inside of it A, B, C. So this whole thing, this whole character class, is going to match A or B or C. But it's only going to match one of those things. It's not going to look for A, B or A, C or anything like that. It's going to match one character that's either an A, B, or a C. The first example here, A, B, C, that's going to match, but it's just going to match this first character. The A is one of those characters in there, and because I don't have any anchors or anything like that, it's going to match this string, but it's just going to match the first character. Similarly, because this is just an A, that's also going to match. It's going to match the, the A in the character class. In a third example, x, y, b, z, that's also going to match, because it's going to match this b. We only have to match one of these characters, and that's sufficient for the match to take place. The empty string, not going to match, because we have to have one of those three characters in there, and the empty string doesn't satisfy that requirement. Just to drive this home a little bit more, the notion that we're only going to match a single character with that whole construct, let's uh, surround this by the anchors at the beginning at the end of the string. So a string that just contains an A, well that's going to match, right? At the we've got an A that's sandwiched between the beginning and the end of the string. Or in the case of this string, it's also going to match. We've got a C that's, an that's anchored between the beginning and the end. On the other hand, this one, not going to match, because we've got two characters in here. And although they're both characters that appear in the character class, we're only matching one of those characters, which means that that's not going to match this string. Now we can also apply quantifiers to character classes. And this is one of the reasons that I've been saying when we use these quantifiers, it's a quantifier that applies to the previous element in the pattern. So when I'm talking about the star here, it's following this character class. It's going to 
imply that we want to look for zero or more, that's the meaning of the quantifier, of the characters A or B or C. Instead of just looking for one of these three characters, we're going to look for zero or more occurrences of those three characters. And I've also sandwiched this thing between the, the two anchors, so we're going to look for strings that contain only those things, only those characters. So here, B, A, C, that's going to match, because we've found a B, we have found an A, we found a C. So we've basically matched three different characters using the same character class because we have the quantifier available to us. So basically any string of A's, B's, and C's is going to match. So here's all A's, B's, and C's, that's going to match. This one, not so much because we've got a big X in there. Uh, so that's not going to match. We've got, and because we have the the anchors, the beginning at the end of the string, we've got to match this whole thing, and because the X is there, that's going to fail. We'll also match, in this case, the empty string, because we're saying between the beginning and the end of the line, here and here, match zero or more of this character class. And so an empty string has zero of those things, so this will match. You can also turn around the sense of a character class and this is unfortunately an overloaded use of the caret. If the first thing in the character class is a caret, that says match any of the characters that are not in the character class. It just reverses the sense of the match. So in this example, we're saying match one character. The character class still matches a single character. Match one of any character that is not A or B or C. So A not going to match because it is one of those characters and we're not looking for one of those characters. B, B, A, C, C, all of those are characters that are being left out of the match, so those aren't going to match. But X, Y, Z, Z, Y, totally going to match because there is some character that is not an A or a B or a C. It turns out that a really common use case for character classes is matching things like any letter or any digit or something to that effect. Here's an example of matching any letter or digit. Now, based on what we know so far, if we wanted to match any letter or any digit, we'd have to explicitly enumerate A, B, C, D, E, F, and keep going 0, 1, 2, up to 9, right? To put that all in one character class. It turns out you do that pretty regularly, and it's sort of tedious to list them all out. So if inside of a character class you can include a dash to indicate a range of values. So here we're saying match A through Z and 0 through 9. One of those characters at that spot in the string. Is A going to match? Absolutely. Z? Absolutely. 3? Yes. Capital S? Not so much. What we've got here is A through Z, and it's going to use these values in the in the collating sequence of the underlying alphabet. When we say lowercase a through lowercase z, that's a sequence of all the lowercase letters. It doesn't include the uppercase letters like capital X, so this will not match. If we want to include the uppercase letters, we'd have to do a different character class. We'd have to say something like a through z lowercase, a through z uppercase, and then 0 through 9 as part of the character class. Here's a little bit more complex one. Here's a character class that's going to be any lowercase letter. Here's a character class that's going to be any digit. And the plus means one or more of these things. Uh, we've got an A and a 0. That's going to match. I've got one letter and one digit. Good. Here I've got, I want to have A through Z one or more times. So I've got A through Z one or more times and a digit. Also going to match. Here I've got A through Z and a digit also going to match, even though I'm not matching the 2 in this case. That's okay because I don't have any kind of anchors going on here at the end. If there was a dollar sign there to say this has to be anchored at the end of the string, then this, this example would not match because I've got an extra character there that's one, one more than the single digit that's being matched by that, um, by that portion of the, of the expression. Here's a question. Uh, what, where do you regularly encounter strings that match this regular expression? Well, let's take a look at what this is. We've got anchors at the beginning at the end, so we were trying to get rid of extraneous characters around this. But this portion is a character class that says match a letter. 
So a single letter, there's no quantifier here. And then this says a single letter, lowercase or uppercase, a digit or an underscore and match zero or more of these things. This would be letter, digit, or underscore. It turns out that this is a pattern that will match um, the typical identifier in a programming language. Right, when you think about declaring a variable in most programming languages or a constant or whatever, it's often required to be a letter followed by zero or more letters, digits, or underscores. And that's exactly what that pattern will match. You can kind of start to see the utility of these sorts of things. If you're writing a compiler, for example, and you're trying to find all of the identifiers in the input to that compiler, this would be a great regular expression to use to do that. Now, we've already introduced this notion of having these abbreviations where we can include a dash between two values. Some of these happen often enough that you are also given some uh, abbreviations for these things. They all start with a backslash and then some single character. Backslash D is a regular expression that matches a digit and it abbreviates this character class. Uh, the backslash capital D matches a non-digit so it's an abbreviation for this character class. Notice it's all the digits but it's negated by including the caret at the beginning. So we can match digits or non-digits. We can match what are called word characters. And I put this in quotes because it's not really word characters. It's more like identifiers. This example that we saw from the previous slide, uppercase letters, lowercase letters, digits, or the underscore. So it's the characters that typically can occur in any but the first position of a programming language identifier. That's what's called a word character. And then the uppercase variant is the non-word characters. So these all appear in pairs, digits and non-digits, word characters and non-word characters. And the third one is white space and non-white space. So a white space character consists of an actual space, there's a space there, or a tab, a new line, a return, or a form feed. Those are kind of using the standard C language abbreviations for special characters that can appear in strings. And then the backslash capital S matches non-space characters. So same list of characters, but negated by the caret at the beginning. So here's another kind of quizzy sorts of things. Let's think about what these regular expressions match. You notice that they're all flanked by caret and dollar sign, caret and dollar sign, caret and dollar sign, to restrict the, the portion of the input string that they would match to just these things. This is something that you'll see is important when you do the homework assignment for the regular expressions. Uh, you'll often need to add the up caret and the dollar sign to prevent your solutions from matching too much. This first example is three digits, a dash, and four digits. So this is a phone number, in the United States at least. Here's another example. We're using the, the numeric quantifiers here. So this is a digit. Three, a digit occurring three times exactly, a dash, two digits, a dash, and four digits. So this would be a social security number in the United States. Again, if you were working on a human relations system where people had to be able to register with your system and provide their social security number for employment purposes, you could use an expression like this to verify that the information that they put in was at least the right syntax. It might still have been a bogus number, but at least it's gonna follow the right pattern. And then this last one is actually a repeat of the previous slide. This is also an identifier, except we've used the, the backslash W as the abbreviation for the characters that appear after the first character. So this is letters, digits, or the underscore zero or more times. And then the first portion is just all of the letters, because most identifiers in most languages require an initial letter, although sometimes you can put an underscore at the beginning as well, but seldom will you have a digit allowed there. Okay, so again, just some practical examples of things that we might actually like to match in practice. We can also match one of several underlying patterns. We use the vertical bar for this, it's called pattern alternation. And we're basically saying if X is a pattern and Y is a pattern, we want to match either X or Y. 
Notice that this is a very low precedence pattern. So if we have a if we have a pattern like A B C or X Y Z, we're saying that this is going to match either the whole thing here on the left A B C or the whole thing on the right X Y Z. It's not going to match an A a B a C or an X a Y and a Z. Okay, so here's an example A or B going to match here. Yes, because there's an A. Here, there's a B, right? And we don't have any anchors here that are constraining the matches. So it's going to match that B. But here we've got neither A nor B, so this will not match. Here's an example where the two patterns are non-trivial, as they were in the first example. We're going to match either red or green in their entirety. So this will match red here. That'll match. And it'll match green here as well. There are times when we would like to take the meta characters and not let them act as meta characters, but to actually match the character itself. So in this first example, I've got this is the standard use of the of the plus, an A, one or more Bs, and a C. So that matches this. But let's say we actually want to match the plus character itself. Well, we can take away its special meaning by prefixing it with a backslash. So backslash plus is actually just a literal plus. So it removes the special meaning of that plus character. We're looking for an A, a B, a plus, and a C. So we're no longer going to match that because there's no plus, but now we've got, this is actually the, the whole pattern, but the whole pattern will also match here. A, B, plus, C. That'll match. Here's another example where we've got a digit. I guess I'm missing some slashes here. We've got a digit zero or more times, a dot, and because we've got the backslash here, that's a literal dot, and then one or more digits. Here's zero or more digits, a dot, and one or more digits, so that would match. Here I've got zero digits, a dot, and one or more digits, so that would match. Similarly, I've got a zero digits, a dot, and one or more digits, so that would also match. So here's an example of some of a pattern that would match um, several formats for a floating point constant. So far, with the exception of the character classes, we've only been able to really refer to a single character in the pattern in th with things like quantifiers. At times, it's helpful to be able to group those things together and refer to them kind of as a single unit. So this first example, and we do that by enclosing a pattern inside of parentheses. So here's a simple example where we've got an A, a B, a C and D that are now grouped together, and then an E. Now in this case, we're not really doing anything interesting or useful with the parenthesis. We're just showing that they can be grouped. So this is going to just match the same thing as if the parentheses weren't there in this case, so kind of pointless. But A, B, C, D, E. So that would match here. Yes, it would not match the second example because although we have the A, B, C, D, we don't have the E. Okay, that's not super interesting, but uh, when we look at some of these other examples, we can see the utility of having these parentheses. Remember before I said that if we have the... Um, the uh, vertical bar in a pattern, it groups very at very low precedence. So it's going to take all three of these characters or these three characters. If I go back here, now I've taken and grouped these two characters, these two literal patterns, and I've put the alternation character in between them within the parentheses. So the parentheses provide a scope within which that vertical bar operates. So this gives it the opposite interpretation of what we looked at before. This will match an A, a B, then either a C or a D, this pattern or that pattern, and then an E. A, B, C, D, E, not going to match because we're only going to match this one or that one and not both. A, B, C, E will match, right, because we've got an A, a B, a C, and the E. A, B, D, E will match, because I've matched one of those two things. Now notice that these elements inside the parentheses, as I'm showing them here, are just single characters, but they could be more 
uh, elaborate patterns. I could have, for example, A, B, paren, uh, C star, or red, E. Right, that would mention A or B, and then either zero or more Cs or R-E-D, followed by an E. So it's not just single characters that can appear in here. They can be complete regular expressions in their own right on either side of the alternation. Here's another example of using the parentheses for grouping. Uh, I'm using the question mark. So this is going to say, at the beginning of the string, match an A, a B, then either a C, D, or nothing, an E and F in the end of the string. So the, because we've grouped these things together, the quantifier applies to the whole group. So the C, D taken together are optional, but the A, the B, and the E and the F have to appear. So here we have A, B, C, D, E, F. That's going to match because we do have a C, D. Here's A, B, C, D, E, F. That portion will also match. Here's A, B, C, E, F. Well, I've got a C, but I don't have the corresponding D, so this is not going to match. A, B, E, F. That's going to match because I have no C, D. That's good. A, B, E, F. Also going to match because I have no CD. Here's another way to express some information about, uh, say, a floating point value. I've got the one or more digits, then I've got this thing all in parentheses with a question mark after it. So this is going to allow me to match one or more digits, optionally followed by the decimal point and one or more digits. You can notice that the backslash character there is making the dot mean a dot and not the wildcard character. So 3.141, that would match. This would also match, right? I've got one or more digits and I don't have anything after the, I don't have a decimal point or anything after it, so that matches. Here I've got one or more digits, a dot and three digits, that will match. But it will not match here, right? Because I have to have one or more digits prior to a dot and the extra digits at the end of the uh, of the number. So this will not match. Again, depending on the syntax, this would be something that you'd use in a language parser or processor. And depending on the syntax that you wanted to allow for numeric constants, you could vary the structure of this regular expression to get it to match different things. The parentheses not only group things, but they also can capture what they matched within the parentheses. So we, for example, we can say, not only do I want to match an A, but I want to capture the fact that I matched an A at that spot. That's interesting because the other new syntax here with capturing is that I can refer to a previously captured value using backslash and then some digit. So this regular expression here is saying match an A and then match the same thing that you matched inside that first group. This would not match, because it's just 1a, and I'm not matching the same thing again. This would match, because I've got an a, and that has now become the value for this backslash 1, so I'm matching it again. And then this would not match, because I've matched an a, and then I've got a b. Now that's not super interesting, because we're matching a single literal character inside the, inside the capturing group. But what can be inside there can be an arbitrary pattern. So here's another example where I'm saying match two arbitrary characters and hang on to those and allow me to refer to them later as backslash one. Whatever those are, are going to be followed by an X and a Y and then another copy of those same two characters. So here I've got AB, which is going to put AB in backslash one, XY, matches here, but then I'm looking for another copy of AB here, which I don't find, so that does not match. Here, I've got AB, that's going to get stored as backslash 1, the literal XY, and then BA, well that doesn't match either, so that's not going to match. Finally, I get to AB, that's stored in backslash 1, followed by XY, and then an AB again, so that pattern will match. So we can use this to refer to previous matches within the string. Okay, so here's another example involving floating point. I'm going to 
try to match this input string with this regular expression. So I've got a group here matching a digit. Then I've got, actually this is incorrect. Let me, um, let me make a change to this. I want, I want there to actually be, right in here, I want there to be a star. Actually, let's make it a plus. So backslash D plus is what's in this first parenthesis. Then I've got a second parenthesis that goes from here over to here. And then I've got an interior one here going to here. So these are going to be grouping and they're also going to be providing um, uh, capturing elements. When we do this match, I'm going to get one or more digits, then optionally a dot, notice the backslash escaping the wild card, followed by one or more digits in this inner grouping. The way that the grouping works when we have nesting like this is you just look for the first parentheses, or the first open parentheses, and that gives you the next matching group. So the first matching group is actually here. So when I'm asking about backslash one, after matching this string with this regular expression, backslash one is going to refer to 333. Right, just the first matching group before I get into the, the, the section here with the, with the decimal point. Backslash two will actually refer to the group that starts at this second open parent. So it will encompass the rest of this pattern, assuming that it matches, which in this case it does. So backslash two is gonna to refer to the decimal point and the fractional part of that value. So here's backslash one, here's backslash two. Now I've got another one here, another open parentheses. So this open parenthesis is gonna to refer to backslash three. It's the third open parenthesis in the pattern. And it's going to then refer, after this match, to just the digits that follow the decimal point. So just these three characters are going to be backslash three. So you can see by using capturing and grouping that if you're reading some input and you want to be able to pull out a specific element of that input, you can enclose parts of the pattern in, uh, in parentheses. Okay, something that we haven't really mentioned so far is that all of the quantifiers that we've discussed, the, the question mark meaning zero or one, the plus meaning one or more, the star meaning zero or more, the M comma N giving that specific range, these quantifiers are what's known as greedy. In other words, they're going to try to match as much of the input string as they possibly can before giving up and, and moving on to the next portion of the pattern. That's often what you want to use, but it turns out that there's variations of these things by tagging or adding it to the end of the quantifier a, sec a question mark, we can reverse their greediness. We can make them non-greedy. Dollar sign followed by a question mark, plus followed by a question mark, star followed by a question mark, and then these numeric quantifiers followed by a question mark give them the opposite nature. They be, instead of being greedy, trying to capture as many characters as they can, they become non-greedy and they try to match as few characters as they can. Let's look at this string. A, one, two, three, four Bs and a C. And I've got some, uh, some capturing parentheses and some, some different quantifiers going on inside of here. All these patterns are basically an A, one or more Bs, one or more Bs, and a C. But I'm, I'm going to mix up the ordinary quantifiers and the non-greedy ones. So the first example here is two greedy quantifiers. So if we're matching this string that has these four B's in it, we've got an, an A anchored at the beginning of the string. I've got one or more B's and then one or more B's and then a C. Both greedy. So if you think about how the regular expression engine is going to interpret this pattern, it's going to match the A at the beginning, then it's going to try to match one or more Bs. Well, because this is a greedy quantifier, doesn't have the question mark after the plus, it's going to try to match as many Bs as it can. So it's actually going to consume all four Bs, and then the regular expression engine is going to look at the next portion of the pattern and say, huh, I need to match one or more B here, but I've 
already consumed all the bees and I'm staring at a C. Well, it's going to realize that that's now a failed attempt to match. And what it's going to do is going to give back one of the bees that is matched. It's going to backtrack. And then it's going to try again. It's going to say, well, okay, well, this bee is going to give back one of its bees. So it's only going to have matched three bees. And that's going to allow for this bee, one or more bee pattern, to match the fourth bee. And then it can match the C. So in this case, backslash 1 will end up being B, 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 and backslash 2 will be B, the final B. The second example here, the only difference from the first is that I've made this quantifier non-greedy. So it's going to try to be as satisfied, it's going to try to be satisfied matching as few B's as it can. We're going to get the A matched, then this is going to match one B, and it's going to go, okay, I'm good and then move on to the next portion of the pattern, which is greedy, and it's going to match the remaining three Bs, and then see the C. Backslash one and backslash two in this case are going to be one B and three Bs. How about the next case? Now I've made both of these quantifiers non-greedy, so we're going to match an A. Again, this guy is just going to want to match one B, and it will succeed in doing that, and then this guy is going to be happy with one B, but because there's more Bs to go before it sees the next element of the pattern, it's going to match three Bs and then the C. So the result of that one is going to be exactly the same. The first one is going to match just one. The second one is going to grab all the rest of them, not because it sort of wants to, but because it has to in order to get past the Bs and match the C. Okay, let's talk about how we use regular expressions in JavaScript. Here's an example uh, of using a regular expression on a string. We've got the pattern. I'm using this as a, a regular expression literal. So I've got one or more digits, a literal dot, one or more digits. And I can execute this regular expression on some input string by using the dot exec method. So Although this looks like an ordinary literal that we might assign to a constant or something like that, it actually gives back a regular expression object that has methods defined on it, including exec for execute. So this is going to say, define this regular expression and then evaluate it with this string as the input. You can just, by looking at this, we can see, well, the, the regular expression is only going to match this portion of the input string. But because we don't have any anchors, that's fine. We'll skip over val space, match that floating point value, and then, uh, and then be, be done. And what I've done here is assign the result of that match to this variable or well, constant called result. And I want to print out different portions of that result object so you can kind of see what, what values you get back. Here I'm just printing out the result itself as an object, and we can see here that the result itself looks like a list. And you might not be familiar with this idea, but lists in JavaScript don't have to have simple numeric values. They can also, also be indexed. So the first thing that shows up in the, uh, in the result list is the entire pattern that was matched. So are the, see, the, yeah, the entire value from the input string that matched the entire pattern. So this matched the whole pattern. Because we had capturing parentheses in here, the next entries here are going to be the result that matched capturing parenthesis number one, so this is backslash one, and capturing parenthesis number two, so this is backslash two. We can also read out the input and some other things here. Um, we can also refer to each of these elements ind individually. So if I say result of zero, and I've printed that out down here, here's zero colon that thing, that corresponds to, you can think of this as backslash zero, uh, it's the whole string. Then result of one up here gives us the thing that was matched by, back, by the first capturing parentheses, two gives us the thing matched by the second capturing parentheses, and so forth. So we can fish out those values directly from the result of executing that regular expression. So here's how you would how you would use a regular expression to kind of parse some input to to uh, divide it apart into multiple fields in a way that makes it easy to grab the values of those fields individually. 
We can also use the test method on a regular expression, which just checks, does this string match this pattern? We've got A, one or more Bs and a C, that obviously matches this pattern, so the result we get back is just a Boolean value of true. So far we've been seeing a regular expression that has defined on it methods that take strings. We can also actually flip that around. I can have a string and then the string object itself has a method defined on it called match that takes a regular expression. So I can pass a string to a regular expression or a regular expression to a string depending on what's what's more convenient. And this basically is doing something quite similar to what we saw before. We've got some capturing parentheses in here. So what comes back from this is the entire string that was matched, then the thing inside the capturing parentheses. So this is what we've been calling backslash zero, backslash one, and then the other fields here, the input and the index at which the max uh, the match occurred. Another thing we can do in strings is search for a regular expression. So this isn't going to do a match. It's basically going to just find the place in the string where the regular expression begins. So if I've got Fred lives in Peru as my string and my pattern is just literal IVES, it's going to find that right here. And that's at position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the 6 is the value of the index into that string at which this regular expression appears. And if the uh, search pattern does not appear in the string at all, you just get negative 1, which is an invalid index into a string. So it's used by JavaScript to say, sorry, couldn't find a match. We can also do search and replace with regular expressions. So here's a string value, and I've just, because I wanted to reuse this, I've just defined it once, Suso's Sue's Socks. And I'm doing a replace operation where it's going to find anywhere that this thing matches and replace it with boo. So the first output here, Sue, is found right here. And it's then replaced with boo. Notice that the default behavior here is that it's only going to do this to the first match of the regular expression. So although boo appears here at the beginning for the first sue, the second sue is left alone in this first output. In contrast, if we add this backslash or the slash g option at the end here, we're basically giving some options to the regular expression object, and the g means global. So it means don't just be satisfied by changing the first instance of sue, but find all of them and replace them all with boo. So now we have boo, so's, boo's, socks. Another really helpful um, string method that uses regular expressions is called split, which you can pass either a string and it will split up the input string uh, by the occurrences of that literal string, or you can use a regular expression. This isn't a super interesting example of this, but um, I'm looking here basically for a, a comma followed by a space. So that appears in my input string here, here, and here. And so passing in this string and doing a split on that comma space gives me as output this array that has each of those elements from the original string separated out into, their, into the individual pieces. There's an inverse operation here as well uh, called join. So if we were to say, create, say, a const, let's call it a equal to stir split slash comma space. So we're basically saying, I want to I want to give this array a name a. If I want to reconstitute a back as a string, I can say a dot join and then give it a string that I want to join it with. So comma, space. And this will basically recreate the original string. It'll take all of the elements in this array A and hook them back together with comma, space in between them. This is a really helpful idiom if you're, say, processing an input file uh, and on each line you want to split up the fields and then do some sort of processing. Let's say I wanted to get rid of all of the yellows that occurred anywhere in my data. It's easiest for me to to split the original input apart and then go in and look for the yellows, get rid of those from these arrays by just using the delete operator. And then later on, I can wire these back together by passing the resulting array here in, or p by calling its join method to connect the values back together and turn them back into a string. Here's a little bit more elaborate example. Um, 
I've got a zip code here. So in the United States, a zip code can be either five digits or it can be nine digits where, it, where it's grouped as five digits, a dash, and four more digits. So here's a regular expression for that. I've got, I'm anchoring at the beginning at the end so that I don't have any extra, extra characters that get matched in there. I'm saying give me five digits and now I've got a capturing group here that's got a question mark after it. So it says zero or more of this parenthesized expression and that contains a literal dash and four digits. So either I'm going to get the five digits followed by dash and four digits or just the five digits all by itself will both match. So again, I'm using the test operator here, 46989, gives me a true value, 46989 with the dash, also gives me a true value. But if I give it alpha, now that doesn't match the pattern at all, so that does not work. We'll see that when we're writing our, um, our application servers, that we can use this extra library that's developed along with Happy as a way to do verification of input strings. So if I've got an input, input field that is supposed to contain a user's zip code as they're signing up for an account or something like that, I can use joy to do this regular expression matching to make sure that that particular field is a non-empty string that matches this regular expression. We'll see more about that as we go. And then here's some resources that you might want to take advantage of. As always, the Mozilla developers site has a ton of useful information about these things. So there's a good guide that gives you a similar kind of introduction to what we talked about in this talk. There's also a good reference information about all the different ins and outs of regular expressions. These two guys are links to online regular expression kind of IDEs that lets you put in regular expressions and put in test strings and kind of sample what matches what. These would be, both of these would be super helpful for your homework if you're not uh, well versed in regular expressions. There's also a, uh, a very considerable text that describes all of the regular expression details in a whole bunch of different contexts, including JavaScript, but also in a lot of other places. If you really want to learn about regular expressions, understanding this book would, would make you an expert for certain.